loving all the energy, loving all the energy in the room. And, um, you know, I think today and tomorrow we really want a lot of this. We want a lot of this energy. We want you to get a chance to meet other members of the 21DXQI family. And uh, looking forward to a great time and great opportunities to collaborate as well. You're too tall. We're looking at your chest. It's okay. So I met a lot today, or even yesterday, yesterday when, when I ran, ran into people, people yesterday, you're like, I had no I idea, idea you just I had no, <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea how it happened. I went in bed yesterday. I was five weeks. I woke up this morning, and I'm like this tall. So I'm as surprised as you guys. But right now I'm talking with endocrinologists. Somewhere. And uh, maybe someone will publish a paper about the guy that went to bed and woke up with an extra foot. So I'm going to start and I'm really excited to meet a lot of you in person. You know, it's been lots and lots of Zoom interactions. And then finally, like, oh, yes, good to see you. Good to see you. So welcome. Thanks for being here. And it's a great honor to welcome you as well. I'm going to very briefly fly through some of this slide because you would experience a lot of what I'm going to talk about today and tomorrow. How are we doing in the 2-1-D exchange? The 2-1-D exchange quality improvement collaborative and how far have we come? So the state of the 2-1-D XQI. The last time we met in person was in 2019. 2019, we met in Texas, Houston, and Dan DeSalvo, Rona hosted us. <laughs> and we had a good time there in 2019. And you look back at where we are now and a lot of things that have changed in 2019 and sure runner would be like where did all these people come from yeah it's uh, from all over the world runner to answer that question and you sort of see our evolution as a network in 2019 we're 10 centers um really committed to quality improvement population health and now we're at 52 centers serving over 8,000 8,000 patients with type 1 diabetes and it's it gives me a lot of joy because it's, it's the value we're providing, it's the care we're improving, it's the outcomes we're changing. And I think that was all of the things that we all should be proud of for how far we've come along. So this year we welcome six new pediatric centers and you can see the, their logos there. So our friends from Intermountain Healthcare, can you guys wave? Are they yes? Okay, all right, okay. How about John Hopkins friends? All right, well, welcome, welcome Cleveland Clinic. OHSU, the CEO, and then UC Davis, UPMC. Well, welcome. So happy to have you. And then welcome seven adult centers. I saw Alexis earlier. What was you? Yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome. And then Hopkins Adults. Welcome. So happy to have you. Billings, Montana. Yeah. UPMC. Welcome. And Cleveland Clinic Adults. OHSU adults, and then Yusuf Davis uh, recently just joined us as well. But with all of the centers we're working with, we stay true and focused on three core elements. We want to continue to bring in the value of quality improvements. And you're going to hear from right after, a little after this session, later this, this morning, you hear from Todd and the panelists sort of talk about what it's like to actually have a robust quality improvement infrastructure, because that's still our true focus. We're staying true to that. I want to make sure that we don't lose track of ensuring that everything we do, we have opportunities to improve and bring in a quality improvement lens. And you're going to see a lot of posters on the wall today and tomorrow highlighting how the sites are using quality improvement methods to really advance care. The quality improvement portal, and you would see a demonstration of that tomorrow. And Mungmudi, leads that work on behalf of the exchange. And that's been a tool that has evolved over the years and it's helpful for benchmarking. You're gonna get a feel for that as well. And all centers have access to that. So if you haven't plugged in or signed on, please do, because it's, it's, it's a great resource. I'm really excited to even further expand it as well. But we're collecting all this data, we're making changes in the clinic. We want to ensure that our efforts don't just stay in the clinic. So there's a panel tomorrow that will be focused a lot on what happens outside of the clinic? How do we advocate? So how do we become a strong advocate for our patients, strong advocate for the diabetes community? Because we strongly believe that 
we can't make all of the changes we want internally alone. We need to sort of start looking outward. And that's probably why the team for this conference, it's advocacy and implementing an advocacy. So ensuring that we're making change within, but also pushing for change outside. So forming questions, we try to answer collectively. Do we have the right kind of data? Are we making the best decisions based on that data? What insights are we getting from data? How are we improving population health, quality improvements? What exactly is driving that improvement? And in the last three years, we've really added this fifth question on how do we ensure that our outcomes are equitable? Because from our own experience, we've seen that you can bring quality improvement lens to anything, but if that system has been designed in of itself not to be equitable, your quality improvement effort will only make the inequities worse. So we're really conscious to ensure that we're bringing in an equity lens to ensure that our work in quality improvement and our collaboration with health equity principles, those things amplify and reduce the inequities as opposed to, to, to uh, make them even more or make them worse. Real world data, lots and lots and lots of data. You would hear a lot of that today, tomorrow, you're gonna to see a lot of posters really talking about data, data. You know, and we've been leaders in this space now in the 2-1-D Exchange Quality Improvement Network, um, you know, on leveraging real world data. And you'd see just recently published um, six different papers really describing how we as a network as is using real world data. It's, 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 it's showing the power of everyday electronic maker across data, everyday qualitative data to really drive an impact change. Um, if you haven't got a chance to read the commentary that she uh, put together, please, it, it's, it's what to read, because she sort of described all of this paper that came out in this issue of clinical diabetes. It's out online and it's all free. And uh, you can take a look at that and I'll, I'll highlight some of this in the next few minutes. So we're collecting all this data, we're changing our data specifications, upgrading that, making sure that the kinds of data we're interested in really matches what's happening on the ground. And you look at the work coming from the data science committee uh, led by Marina and Joyce, and that group has been spending a lot of time to think about what should we bring in, what should we take out, how should we adapt that? So if you have thoughts or ideas on the data specification, find Joyce, find Marina, I'm sure they'll love to get your inputs as well, because that work continues to evolve as, as you know, we scale this. And then we're mapping all this data, working with uh, different stakeholders to bring in all this data into an environment that we can all learn and share and use together. So this year, we've been able to have many more sites contribute to the data and in sort of huge increase there, close to 150% increase in the kinds of data we've been able to bring in. And there've been other studies we're supporting over the years. So we've supported a, a wide variety of different projects. This is what our code looks like now for the map data. We have a little over 54,000 patients. We will end the year with about 58,000 patients once we complete validation for some of the sites that are in the late stages now. This is an asset for you all, for everyone in this room, everyone contributing data. You have power from not just the number of patients in your center. So you have 1,000 patients or 2,000 patients or 500 patients. Now you can answer critical questions with over 50,000 patients with type 1 diabetes. Um, and this is real world data. This is everyday patients coming into the clinic. Um, patients are not, not self-selecting. You're not signing up to be a part of uh, a research study. We've been able to work collaboratively to collect all this data and find data so that we get a true sense of what type 1 diabetes care actually looks like in the US. And you know, I'm very proud of this work. I think we all should be proud of this work because this is really what's making us, this is our strength. This is what we bring on the table. And, and, and there's so much we can answer with this question. You know, at the peak of the T1D Exchange Clinic Registry, there was about 36,000 patients with type one. And very easily, we're gonna be double that by mid next year. You know, and, and, and this is something that we all should uh, remember as we think about the critical questions and how we ensure that we can use this to really drive an improved change. So our friends from Children's National Brain Max and team started to also look at quality improvement and the culture of improvement. Like I shared earlier, we're very focused on 
who we are as a network, ensuring that quality improvement is uh, not there, and we're bringing all that insight, bringing all of that efforts. And you can check out this paper from Greenmax that really explains and describes and also looks at some of the connecting factors or association factors between peds and adult centers, centers based on region, centers based on when they join the collaborative and some really insightful findings in this work. But why I highlight this paper, it's the, the as different as we are, uh, with different cultures, different capacity, different breakdown, we're sharing something together. We're sharing quality improvement and a desire for quality improvement. And we're lighting with this work, just the opportunities for us to come where you are, start where you are, but can we all evolve and can we all sort of grow and increase? And there's a follow-up paper that is looking at that question that will be um, out next year. And then our pr approach is very different from traditional research. So Brain Max also sort of, um, you know, took a deep dive to explain like, hey, this is traditional research, the way you would think about it. This is what quality improvement looks like. And this is what a lot of the centers are. So I encourage you to take a look at that, um, which is a work from us. And then Emma um, and, and Nudra from our team in collaboration with Mary Scott, and I saw her earlier, um, started to really explore capturing your voices as providers, capturing your voices as members of this network. So understand barriers, understand facilitators, understand from your point of view, how do we move the needle on different things? So we looked at smart insulin pain, and now we're looking at antibody screening, and you'll hear a little bit about that too tomorrow. So it sort of gives you a sense on, even within our group, using this group as an avenue to learn from our peers in a very structured way, qualitative interviews and a lot of those things that we're really building in, into the works there. So if you're interested in qualitative studies, this is the group, this is the place, and then lots of opportunities um, for you to sort of get insight from close to 300 peers, endocrinologists, peds and adults that are part of the network that are willing and eager to contribute and support some of this work as well. So we're collecting tons and tons of data, but are we making the best decisions? Can we improve? What can we use to drive improvement? You know, and our friends at um, um, Radish Children really wanted to explore this question. So Carla um, and, um, and Laura Jacobson from University of Florida sort of took on this topic and this question on what is driving getting to less than seven to Janine's point, what's driving that in our cohorts? What can we learn from that? And this is a very insightful paper that really tries to touch on some of those metrics, some of those principles, some of those contributing factors. And it's worthwhile um, to take a minute to look into from our network, from our collaborative, um, where are we and how do we ensure that we can really sort of get more patients to less than seven? Because that's where we want to be. And that's the power of this network. And that's our aim and what we're really striving towards. And then Halis and um, um, Sarit from Baba Davis Center in Adult Baba Davis Center and took that same question and looked at the adult population and like, what do we learn from this? Uh, what insight can we use to support our initiative, support our advocacy efforts, support our quality improvement project, support our, our policy work, support our population health insights. And, and they uncovered quite a number of things too in the adults cohorts, looking at um, data for over 12,000 patients, um, you know, greater than eight, oh, 18 or over with, um, you know, with type one diabetes in our cohorts. So sort of this sort of gives you a sense on the kinds of work that's been coming out from this network this year and, 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 and a whole lot that it's in, in the pipeline for next year already. And I'm grateful to all of our faculty that are leading, coming up with ideas, come writing all of this, all, all of the work to really ensure that we're learning as much as we can. Lots of new technologies coming in and we want to ensure that for the new technologies coming to play, are those technologies really meeting some of the desired outcomes? Are we evolving with those technologies? So hybrid closed loops, you know, lots of excitement about that, but what is the real world data saying that? And that's one of our strengths as a network. There's a new insight, there's a new technology with over 54,000 plus patients. We can start to learn from that. And, and the work with Nudrat and Manu and Rana and a host of the other quarters there, explore this question on hybrid closed loop. What can we learn from this? That was in diabetes care earlier this year. So tons of other insights, tons of other papers that have been out from our network. And um, you know, we're gonna put a link in the chat, the, um, list of all of the different publications. So you can access those 
and um, and and we're going to share additional ways you can be involved in in publications and in writing. Shida and Shivani lit uh, our publications committee, and they're going to do a session tomorrow afternoon, highlighting some of this the broader piece of this work, and also sort of touching on other ways you can be a part of this effort. So what's driving this improvement? What tools, what resources do we have? Um, Anne from our group, and Clement, Todd, um, you know, work together on really using the quality improvement portal. So this is the tool I referenced earlier. And if you haven't been on this tool, really check it out. And it's available to your fellows, to other faculty members of your group. But a very unique piece about this is the power of benchmarking. How can I learn from the University of Miami and I can see their data? How can I learn from Radio Children, from National, Children's National, from Northwestern, from all of the centers that are here? What's the data showing? What's my showing? How do I sort and filter for different variables? Um, and if I see something I like, I can reach out to them right on the portal. I can tag folks. I can, hey, look, I see this interesting thing of your trending. CGMUs or in pump use or in A1C or any of the other metrics you care about. What did you guys do differently? Or I can read a case study on the, on, on, on the, on the portal as well. So this paper really describes that tool, the benefit of the tool. Anne is doing a session tomorrow on additional value of this as well. So you check that out if you're trying to decide what's for 10. You know, and a host of other features that have been added you know, in the last year on the quality improvement portal. But we know that we can have all of these tools, we can have all of these data insights. We always want to keep striving for improvement. So, you know, our network, we are constantly thinking about what else, what else can we add on? What else can we do? What else, what additional insights, what additional practical steps, practical processes can we make available from our experiences? So we teamed up to really explore new tools, new quality improvement tools that can help us start to drive quality improvement using an equity lens. So myself, Shivani, Sonia, and all of the other co-authors there, um, you know, tackled this question to put out this paper with a special issue um, with um, Shivani at the guest editor for this diabetes spectrum piece. Um, but that actually that whole series sort of highlights really robust um, opportunities for us as a network, you know, driving this field around health equity and bringing in lots of new tools into the space as well. So if you haven't seen this work, please check it out because I think you'll find one or two things there helpful. And then we want to stay focused on driving positive outcomes. That's what we care about. We're having a good time, we're learning, we're sharing, but is it making a difference? Is it improving? You know, and we're seeing that improvement, um, you know, from the adult measures, from smart sheets, from the backend data, so driving improvements, a lot of quality improvement metrics. I'm going to move from this slide because I know a lot of you are going to say, where is my team? What's that number? I'm like, oops, I'm done. Next. Yeah. And then the pediatrics team sort of also seeing that same improvement as well. And, and you'll have all of this available and there'll be uh, a call in the you know, January during a collaborative call where there'll be a deep dive into more of these metrics as well. So, so don't worry, this is not a scorecard. We're just sort of highlighting how much we're evolving as a group and, and what we're happy to see. So, so much has happened this year. Uh, so far, there have been 18 manuscripts that are online, uh, published. Uh, we think we're probably going to end the year in about 20. Um, if you have friends reviewing some of our other papers, tell them to be quick, get it up. And uh, there have been you know, presentations at different conferences from ATTD to ESPAD, Manu and Mark represented a collaborative at ESPAD and um, you know, positions at NCQA, ADCAS. Um, and, you know, if there's an opportunity for us to share what we're learning, we're there. And I'm grateful to all of our faculty members that are always more than willing to um, share on behalf of this network and all of the things we're doing. You know, a lot of our papers have continued to receive huge um, recognition from, you know, being a future paper to being most read and most cited. And thank you, too, for sort of citing and referencing this work in, in, in what you do. It, um, it makes a difference. I want to ensure that we continue to help others outside of this network learn from what we are experiencing as well. And then, uh, you know, just at this learning conference alone, there'll be 36 different abstracts all across the world outside. So during the lunchtime or during your break, I encourage you to just take a walk there and you see a poster for something interesting, uh, you know, reach out to 
any of the faculty member. And if you need help connecting names or connecting people, just ask any of the 2-1-D exchange staff. And like, who is Nana? I'll take you to Nana. I'll point you out. Yeah, oh, where's Mary Pat? Where's Mary Pat? I'll show you Mary Pat. I know her. I text her all the time. You know? So anyway, we can help to bridge that guy, bridge that connection. We're here for that. And we have a lot of our 2-1-D exchange staff here in the room to really help support that piece. And um, Shivani did a commentary, a really nice commentary that captures all of this work happening here at the learning session. So check out the commentary, check out the published abstracts in Journal of Diabetes, their partners, a journal partner today. And you'll hear from uh, Robert, Robert Rappaport tomorrow. He's gonna to talk about uh, Journal of Diabetes partnership and, and that as a resource too for this network. So we have very active partnership with clinical diabetes and with Journal of Diabetes and we're looking to grow that in the future as well. Shivani and Shide has a lot of ideas. So if you are on the boards of other journals, and you want us to be on it, please uh, reach out to Rashida and Shivani because we, we want to ensure that we continue to push this work. Um, I see Linda, I see a few other folks too, like you gotta get us there, we're, we're ready, we're ready to go. So but our work, we're not just learning internally, we're not just learning within the US, we are collaborating actively with other networks outside of the US. So we have active partnership with about seven different registries outside of the US. So we're learning with DPV, Dan DeSalvo, David Mass, did a ton of work this year with our friends at DPV. Uh, we're learning with the uh, England and Wales registry and PDA. We're doing a lot of work with the Swedish registry and, um, and then ADDA and the Australian registry is a group that we're also building a partnership with. So if you have interest um, on looking at collaboration outside of the US, um, we're the groups to talk to. David Mass heads up our international collaboration. So reach out to him if you have ideas on topics of interest or things that you're curious on what's happening in Germany or in Sweden or in Brazil or in Nigeria, he'll tell you. Yeah, he's really helping sort of push the needle on that as well. And then I'm wrapping up now to sort of all of these efforts want to make sure they remain equitable, that we are closing the gaps. Uh, we don't want to improve without bringing this intentionality here. And you know, so to do that, we've made equity one of our huge focus areas in the last two years. Um, and we're exploring different aspects of our equity work. You know, we can spend two hours just talking about what the collaborative is doing in health equity. So if you are curious on that, um, you know, just let us know. We can share some of those contents for you. You know, but my colleagues Ori and Ananta um, started to explore the concepts of implicit bias, what's racial and insurance mediated bias. And this is a very interesting work, really looking at from the network, um, our understanding on some of these topics and what's driving bias, both kids and adults, what's different. What are some of the factors that um, it's important to you as pediatric or adult providers in prescribing technology and prescribing CGM and prescribing forms? And we highlighted a few things from this work. So check that out because um, I think that you might find some insights there as we think about and as we think about our roles as gatekeepers or our roles as providers in this work, because it's really critical that we hold a mirror to ourselves and look in the mirror and what is my role in the inequities I'm seeing? What is my role? What's my contribution to that? And how can I be an agent of change as an individual? How can I be an agent of change as a leader? How can I be an agent of change as a member of the diabetes community, because there's a lot for us to do. There's a lot for us to uncover and, and we want to sort of tackle that on. You know, we've, um, as a group, sort of put our thoughts on paper on, there are six ways we have the resources, the power, the strength to work on. And, you know, we published this last year, really sort of describing our approach to this, from real world data to bias, to quality improvement, to, the portal for our health equity advancement lab, the Hugh group, you know, and, and working with patients and parents, uh, particularly those from vulnerable communities to ensure that they have a voice, they have a say, they have a seat on the table. They're helping us think about changes, helping us think about improvements. And, you know, we're really sort of seeing all of those efforts take shape. And in future meetings, we'll be able to share more on what we're learning and uncovering, you know, with that. But, our work is making a difference. The difference 
might, you know, might be a little slower than we all want, but we're seeing that difference. Now we looked at outcomes on like device use without interventions. And what we see is that those outcomes sort of stay stable. But when you bring in intentionality into some of this work, you bring in equity principles, population health insight, you bring in um, people on the table that are impacted, you're testing out changes with an equity lens, we can start to see some of those gaps close. Um, and what we what we deciding to do is we don't want to accept things the way they are, or like keeping the trends for what it is. Let's start closing some of those, you know, and um, we're seeing some of that work among the pilots, eight sites working on, on this project now. We're looking to expand these efforts as well. So, and there'll be a paper um, early next year really highlighting all the things we learn and also a change package that really captures what is eight centers learn and how we're gonna scale and expand this to others looking to do this work. So health equity, huge focus area from QI work, working on connected pain, um, also a new sort of special projects, um, a special projects things that are not part of our routine, but we're sort of bringing them intentionally into the space. Uh, we've looked at um, fear of hypoglycemia in adult centers, antibody screening, um, lots of real world data studies, and then we just started to pilot a type two network. So, so look out for more of that. And the rationale for that is we know that we're two on the exchange. And like, are we changing our name? Maybe, we'll see. However, more importantly, we also know we can learn a lot from patients with type two diabetes. And we've heard that from you as well. So for us, the reason for piloting the type two studies is bringing in insights from what we've been doing in type one, taking some of that to type two, seeing what we can learn from patients with type two and insights, they're bringing that into type one. Um, so strategically, those are some of the reasons why we're doing um, some of those initiatives and you know, funding permitting, we're gonna look to expand more of that so that we can have more people be a part of that work in the future. So if you're interested in this, let us know. And by us, any of us, and if you're not sure who to contact, you send an email to qi at 21dexchange.org. Someone sees it, someone's going to respond, and you know we'll, we'll connect you with the right resource if you're unsure of who to get in touch with. So we are a huge community, um, more than 300 people, you know, providers, analysts, diabetes educators, nurses, psychologists. Um, we are a great team and really proud of our groups. And we have leaders from all of the centers that are part of our clinical leadership group and clinical leadership group, you would hear from them tomorrow and with Devin on the adult side and, and Todd on the pediatric side, they help sort of guide and shape our strategic directions and, and um, what we measures and all of those sort of thing. Um, and we also have a parallel group, Biotech Equity Advancement Lab. So bringing it intentionally into it, we want to lead with equity. So you would see, members of the HUE group, and you get a chance to meet some of them um, you know, today, tomorrow. Four main committees that um, are driving and pushing this work and two sort of additional support groups as well. The publication committee, data science, data governance, and our data governance work is led by Dan DeSalvo and Carol, um, our, our friend from um, Mount Sinai Adult. So if you have questions about what happens to all this data, are we selling the data? <laughs> Go ask them, they'll tell you. They'll tell you all about it. So um, they really ensured that we remain practical to everything we do. And um, you know, we go to them if um, for interactions with industry um, and if they're concerned. So we go to them and they'll tell us yes, they'll tell us no, they'll tell us let's think about it. Um, but if you do have concerns, any data concerns, please um, know that they are your resource. We are your resource, but also know that um, they're there for that purpose and they're there to ensure that you feel safe and you feel trusted and know we do take this responsibility your data with us um, you know really seriously and we, and we do all we can to ensure that we stay true to the agreement and the contract and all of those fun stuff as well and then we have our patient parent advisory committee our patients and parents are central to everything we do because the outcomes for them outcomes for our patient and parents and we have a good Number of them, yeah, there's Amy, always with bright smiles, see you, and then there's Jeff, and, and, and then uh, we have other patients and parents in the room, 
And I do want you all today and tomorrow to think about, you know, reaching out to any of our patients or parents and you know, ask them key questions on, you know, how can you get more patients engaged in your work? What does it look like? What sort of efforts they bring on? And you would hear from them tomorrow as well, um, during some of the breakout sessions, or probably even today, later this afternoon. So we want to stay true to this work has to be with our patients, with our parents, and we're not doing them a favor. We're collectively working together to improve care and they're on the table and, and they have a strong voice. So please reach out to them and the year for that purpose to ensure that they can provide a resource to you. They can be on your team's call. They can join um, any of the, any opportunities to really help engage other parents or patients in your group as well. Uh, so I get to stand here and sort of highlight all of the work we do, but it's literally been a collaborative effort with many of you in the room, um, sort of to, you know, some of our co-chairs, because uh, we, we bother them a lot. So I thank you for all of the efforts you're doing. And, and these sort of folks do, if you have specific questions on publications or data governance or clinical leadership or data science or international collaboration. And then I shared some of these examples earlier about um, our work has continued to evolve as we think about sustainability of this work. We're grateful to all of the support from the Hemsley Charitable Trust and Laura, our uh, project officer is here. And uh, if you see her, say hi and say thank you. And, um, you know, Hemsley has been a huge believer and supporter in this work, and we're grateful for that collaboration. You know, but we do want to ensure that we have other stakeholders you know, contribute to this and be a part of this effort. So we're guided in our, our relationship with the industry and we have some of our industry colleagues, a few of them here with us today. But, you know, be, be rest assured that we see industry as partners working with us to improve outcomes. And we can do that in a way that everybody wins. And but more importantly, in the way that outcomes are improved for, for patients. And, you know, so far they've been happy They've been satisfied. We've been satisfied. We track our efforts with industry and, you know, in the spirit of QI, tracking, do people like what we see? Are the outcomes helpful? Is it meaningful? You know, and it's been meaningful, I think, for some of the projects we've been working on and we'll continue to expand this. So if there are, um, you know, industry contacts or people that are doing Work and you sort of want us to be part of the reason why our name is the exchange is because we can be in the in the middle and exchange all of those, exchange ideas, exchange principles to really ensure we can help facilitate some of those. So um, let us know. We're more than happy to continue to play that role of um, being in exchange and ensuring that industry can also benefit from this in a meaningful way, and we can all um, work towards our shared goal. It's been a great year. The state of the 2-1-D exchange is strong. The state of the 2-1-D exchange is vibrant. The state of the 2-1-D exchange is innovative. The 2-1-D exchange is growing. And the 2-1-D exchange is delivering real-world outcomes um, for patients with type 1 diabetes. And I hope that you can all be very proud of all we've accomplished this year, from the number of patients that have been touched to the different tools and resources, to the data that have been collected, to all of the projects going on, um, we've been track of all of this effort, all of this project. So curious on what side is doing something on X, Y, Z, just ask the question. You can ask any of your coaches and they will sort of direct you and lead you there. Um, we've expanded our work with other networks, you know, other international collaborations. If there's a conference talking about diabetes, we will be there. One of us will be there. With 300 people in our group, we'll get someone there. And, um, you know, it's been, you know, so sort of great to sort of see that our work evolve. You know, and our story continues. We're writing the story. We're uh, not done yet. And, you know, from 2016, when we started as a pilot with 10 centers and sort of expanding to where we are now in 2022, 52 centers with all of the great things that we as a network have been able to accomplish. And our plans for the future, I think we're really excited about what the rest of the story will look at. And, and we, we, you know, we are looking forward to working with you, working with your centers, working with your leadership to continue to write this story, write the story of the 2 d Exchange Quality Improvement Collaborative 
as one that is a huge resource to the diabetes community, a resource to everyone um, that cares about improving outcomes for patients with diabetes. My coordinating center team, just a big shout out to them. They spent a ton of energy and efforts putting together this great conference and, and, and working with you all every day. So when you send an email to QI at 2 the Exchange, um, one of these folks gets back to you and or they're working with you on data mapping, or they're working with you on quality improvement coaching. And, and we just had done um, also joining us and supporting some of our work as we grow and expand on the, the quality improvement space. So um, we're all smiles and we're all happy. All colored pictures, except from Nicole, we're gonna get a colored picture there. You know, but um, I think we we are really pumped for you know how we're going and and um, you know we, we are your resource. We are here for you. We're here to support you. We're here to support your journey. And while their faces are here, we also have a, a broader team outside of the QI team that supports events like this. So our marketing and communications team, and we have many of the members here. Um, Kelly Miller just recently joined us from the JAB, and she's helping us get the big grants, guys. And I'm really excited to have our expertise. You know, we have um, a lot of, um, you know, from our writers. So our communications team reaching out to you, wanting to do a story, I wanted to future your new paper, or promote your work. We're here for that. So just let us know. And we have a huge um, resource in the network to amplify the work you do and to ensure that um, we continue to grow and scale all of our efforts. 2023 has a lot in stock for us as a network. I'm really excited for what it holds. You know, we have big plans, we have robust ideas, we have lots of things spread in the work. Uh, Q4 of 2022, we're looking to expand a lot of the work we're doing in the psychosocial and behavioral support space. We're looking to um, take our health equity work, you know, like three, four degrees even higher. The tons of things we're trying to do, some new NIDDK grant applications we're putting in. So if you have a review on that or you have a friend, just, yeah, you know, be nice to us. We're, we're good people. Um, you know, putting in, and also for our new centers, we know we've grown and other love centers here. So we want to make sure that you have those same experiences that the pilot centers have had and you feel integrated and connected to this group. It's a, it's a family, it's a big family, um, but we are being very intentional in ensuring that everyone feels integrated, everyone feels a part of this, everyone is benefiting and learning and growing. And, um, and we write good letters of promotion to as well. We do everything in between. So um, our goal is to ensure that you're getting as much value from the network so if there are ways for us to strengthen and support value for you, let us know. We're open to all those ideas and um, we're open to this collaboration as well. And also done other sort of cool grant applications with a lot of centers here, really looking at, at expanding and scaling out of those. You know, both advocacy and strengthening the work we're doing outside of the collaborative, it's something that we're taking on more with. You know, we are... Um, sharing our data with the CDC, we're sharing our data with NCQA that is responsible for like the HEDIS measures. We are involved in conversations with state Medicaid offices. And most recently, we started conversations with Medicare. And we see those things as really important because we are bringing together the largest group of centers working with real world data in type 1 diabetes. So I want to ensure that they have a sense of what we're learning. They see the impact of our work. They see the value and know that some of the changes that they make really impact who we are and what we're trying to do. So if the opportunities for us to even play a bigger role as a trusted source for quality improvement, for population health, for real world data, um, we're here and we're a resource to the community. You know, finally, the Hemsley Charitable Trust, um, uh, immense gratitude to the team at Hemsley that have really been huge supporters and advocates for us. I also want to appreciate all of our other supporters um, and industry that we've been working with in the last year, from Vertex to Abbott to Mankind, Jensen, Eli Lilly, um, our journal partners, Journal of Diabetes, Clinical Diabetes, and then um, Children with Diabetes as well, Jeff's group, and, and a host of others not on this list. It's been a true community and sponsoring and supporting different aspects of this, different collaboration. Boston University um, CME office 
you know, and it, just sort of think about um, the number of people that we're bringing together to really be a part of this work. We are one family. We are one lots of leaders, lots of projects, lots of people leading publications, lots of people speaking on our behalf. Um, and we like to talk to the press too. Just recently read um, the press interview with Dan DeSavo highlighting some of the work they did in, um, with the DPV uh, paper on Helio Endocrine Today. And, and um, you know, lots of those kinds of opportunities. So, you know, we promote the work we do in the network to even lay audience, you know, and, um, and now 52 centers strong, think about going that like five times where we are just a little over two years ago um, to publications, to metrics that have been improved. Um, and those are lives impacted. Those are patients, parents, those are families that, because of a change you're making in your clinic, because of a change you're making in your practice, because of a change you're making in um, your administration, that those changes are impacting lives today. And we're not waiting for when that research becomes evidence-based, if it works and it's meaningful and it's helpful and can improve a life today, we want to do it. And that's, that's what makes us different from um, just the traditional research network. We are all for, can this make a difference today? And this improve a life today, then let's do it. And let's make that change. You know, and, um, and we'll continue to sort of grow our footprint in the US. And we're really looking that you know, in the next few months, as we add more centers, we can truly become a source of data as we explore the incidence and prevalence of type one in the US. So it's 22 states now, and we're adding some new states early next year. That's an area that there's been a gap to really explain and understand what is type one diabetes now today, not just with select centers, but a true picture of the landscape of the US. And, and, and we're filling that gap and a lot of others as well. You know, and then you know, we're adding partners, really helping us grow this work. So it's, a, it's, it's one family and we're learning, we're sharing, we're growing. We are fun. You heard some of the Spanish music today. We're gonna have some more during lunchtime. And, uh, you know, and then the tonight dinner, we're going to celebrate our these um, people that have gone out above and beyond to this year to really, you know, demonstrate the spirit of the 2 one day exchange, demonstrate the value of the 2 one day exchange. So welcome. Have a great conference and be ready to dance. <laughs> and we look forward to our further collaboration. Thank you. All. I appreciate it.